Good afternoon and good evening. I'm Juliette Parker, the director of ALNAP, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the launch of the fifth edition of ALNAP's State of the Humanitarian System report, kindly hosted here in Nairobi by the Kenya Red Cross Society. ALNAP is the active learning network for accountability and performance in humanitarian action. And our role, as our name suggests, is to support and enable learning for improved humanitarian performance. Created as a result of learning from the Rwanda genocide response, ALNAP is marking its 25th anniversary this year. And as the findings of today's report clearly show, the challenges currently facing the humanitarian sector are significant. And the need for the sector to come together to reflect and act on the basis of learning and evidence is as important now as it ever has been. The 2022 edition of the State of the Humanitarian System report looks at the period from January 2018 to December 2021, a period that encompassed the global COVID-19 pandemic as well as multiple protracted and new armed conflicts. This landmark report draws on a vast body of experience, including exclusive research from crisis-affected people and practitioners, and addresses key questions about humanitarian performance and effectiveness. For over a decade, this report has supported learning and improvement in the sector by providing a unique, evidence-based understanding of the system and how well it works for affected people. This has been a long process for ALNAP three years of effort, but we've not done it alone. I'd like to acknowledge the work of Alice Obrecht and Sophia Swithin, who have been our co-leads and co-authors of the report. Sophia is joining us from the UK today and has been the substantive lead on many of the report's chapters, and we're delighted that she's online to help answer your questions on the report's findings. We'd also like to extend our sincere gratitude to the dozens of researchers and partner organizations whose data and analysis made this report the credible reference that it is, especially the country-based researchers who went above and beyond to capture the key issues facing humanitarians and crisis-affected people in their countries. We'd also like to thank our ALNAP member organizations who supported the evidence base for this report by circulating surveys and providing evaluative evidence and other data. A few housekeeping points before we get started. Firstly, for those of you online, the event is being simultaneously translated into French, Spanish, and Arabic, and you will have received instructions on how to access it through the chat. There will be an opportunity for questions during the event. For those in the room, we have a roving mic, and for those online, please do submit comments on the chat function and questions on the Q&A throughout the event. Finally, please do join the conversation about the report online using the hashtag SOHS. 2022. And with that, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Alice Obrecht, ALNAP's Head of Research and Impact, who will talk us through the key findings of the report. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet, Dr. Mohammed, esteemed panelists, the Nairobi humanitarian community, and our global online audience. I'm delighted to be presenting to you today the highlights from our fifth edition of the State of the Humanitarian System Report. So as Juliet mentioned in the outset, uh, the State of the Humanitarian System report provides the longest running evidence base on the performance of the international humanitarian system, reaching back over nearly 15 years over four previous editions. And this year's report covers humanitarian response from 2018 to, 2020, uh, to 2021 inclusive. Each of our reports has been compiled through at least 10 main inputs, including original in-country research, surveys, financial and demographic, demographic analysis, and a synthesis of evaluations in key literature. Drawing on these inputs, we're not only able to assess performance, but also draw comparisons across previous reports in order to provide the long view on how the humanitarian system is changing over time. And one of the defining features of this year's report is that the humanitarian system is facing challenges unlike those it has seen before, as the world experiences almost unprecedented levels of risk and crisis. One only needs to reflect on recent headlines to see how these crises are playing out week after week in 2022, as we witness the first war on European soil since the 1990s in Ukraine, and the ripple effects of that conflict reverberating worldwide in food shortages, and rising energy prices, 
as well as ongoing climate disasters from catastrophic flooding in Pakistan to the worst drought in 40 years in Somalia. Crises present all of us with an opportunity to define what it means to be human and to express our shared humanity with others. For over a century, the international humanitarian system has provided a formal mechanism for expressing this shared humanity across borders. And the questions we'd like to pose for you today are how has this system performed over the past four years of extreme crisis, and what does that mean for the potentially challenging years to come? I'm going to try to answer those questions by highlighting key findings from the report across four main areas. First, uh, to understand the demand for humanitarian action and how that's shifted. Then looking at the size and capacity of the humanitarian system, its performance, and then the period of change and contestation that we have seen since the global summits and agreements made over five years ago. Starting with the global context, over the past four years, we have seen conflicts increasing in frequency and duration, regime change in Afghanistan and Myanmar, and the most significant disaster in Haiti since the, since the 2010 earthquake, along with cascading climate-related disasters. And this is all before we get to the unprecedented global pandemic of COVID-19. The impacts of conflict and disaster have been clear, as the number of people living in forced displacement, a key demographic for humanitarian assistance, doubled over the past decade. And just in the past five years, the number of people facing acute food insecurity rose by 33%. When we turn to the pandemic, while the direct impacts of COVID-19 were not as severe as first feared, the indirect impacts through widespread economic shutdown and lockdown restrictions were profound. Protection risks soared, millions of children lost access to education, and nearly 100 million people worldwide were estimated to be pushed below the extreme poverty line, making them less able to withstand other shocks. And as a result of all these dynamics, we saw the number of people estimated to be in need of humanitarian support nearly double over a five-year period, reaching 255 million in 2021, after peaking at 439 million in 2020 due to the pandemic. Now, while at the same time the number of people affected by crises increased, the ability of humanitarians to stand in solidarity with them became even more challenging. In our last report in 2018, we noted a sharp decline in the respect for international humanitarian law, and the situation has only worsened in the past four years. It can often feel like an over-exaggeration to say that there's a battle or fight for the very existence of humanitarianism. But these are the phrases that we heard time and time again, and not just from the hallways of Geneva, but from local actors in Venezuela, Bangladesh, DRC, and beyond. This is illustrated by the rise in attacks on aid workers, which rose by 67% between 2017 and 2021, with national staff comprising 95% of the victims of those attacks. But the pressures also came elsewhere, including from bureaucratic impediments put in place by governments and armed groups. And within this context of shrinking respect for the right to humanitarian assistance and protection, the system has struggled to find its voice. Local civil society actors criticized international agencies for prioritizing access at all costs, paying for presence with their silence and humanitarians on the ground found it harder to apply the principles, lacking the support, skills, and the will to make difficult judgment calls. As one person we spoke with said, the system is in a fight for core norms. So, as the job became more difficult, how has the system's size and capacity changed to meet this? Our research focuses on the international system, which we primarily consider to be organizations that receive international, private, or public funding for humanitarian response. This includes NGOs, both national and international, UN agencies, the Red Cross Red Crescent Movement, and the branches of governments involved in humanitarian donorship or response. This system has expanded over the past decade as seen in the doubling of in-country humanitarian personnel. And the estimated number of humanitarian organizations has also grown from roughly four 4,500 to over 5,000, primarily due to the increase of local and national organizations. Funding for humanitarian action also doubled over the decade, reaching 31.3 billion US dollars in 2021. But as many of us are aware, this funding leveled off in recent years, and as a result, 
the gap between what is required to support people in crisis and what is available has widened. The green blocks on the chart behind me here indicate the levels of resource available, and the black dots above them indicate required funds. And as you can see, the line between those two gets ever longer as we move from 2012 on the left all the way to today on the right, with 2020 being the year in which this gap reached an all-time high, with appeals only being 51% funded. When we look beyond the global figures to a more granular level, we can see two important trends. The first is that there is significant variation in the funding levels for different crises. As an illustration of this, 40% of all humanitarian assistance went to just five countries in 2021. And while these, certain, these countries certainly featured some of the highest caseloads, there was also a severity of need in other crises that received far less than what was required. A second trend or reflection from the data is that the system continues to be highly concentrated in terms of who gives and who directly receives humanitarian funding. In 2021, 53% of funding was provided by five donors, and 47% of all funding went directly to three UN agencies. The concentration from so few donors in particular highlights the longer-term vulnerability of the system's finances, as we saw with the sharp reduction in the UK government's funding in 2021. In addition to diversifying the resource base, the humanitarian system needs to do a better job of recognizing, understanding, and complementing the many other sources of support available to people affected by crisis, including the efforts by diaspora groups, faith-based actors, and the efforts that affected populations undertake for themselves. Now, while the scale of this support is estimated to be vastly greater than international humanitarian aid, it is not easily quantifiable, and little is known about how it overlaps with the system's efforts, which makes it difficult to complement effectively. Another area that proved challenging in connecting with those outside the international humanitarian system was in the uh, humanitarian development peace nexus. While there was progress on the nexus at global policy levels, implementation faltered and did not lead to observable improvements in capacity or in, in, in the ability to address compounded vulnerability and risk at a country level. So, while the system has expanded significantly over the past decade, it has not been able to keep up with the rising demand for humanitarian support. Funding is also uneven across crises and remains concentrated in terms of who gives and directly receives IHA. And to address capacity challenges, humanitarians could be doing more to connect with wider efforts by other actors that provide solidarity and support to people affected by crisis. I want to move now to how the system actually performed. So what did it achieve, and how well is it working for affected populations? Despite the increasing challenges posed by the pandemic and the constraints on humanitarian space, there were several bright spots here. One being that the basic effectiveness of humanitarian action continues to be evidenced, even though we still see important gaps, namely around mortality data in crises. We tried to focus in our report on evidence for outcomes rather than outputs. So in other words, what did the system achieve rather than what did it deliver? And we found that there were many examples here covering education, water and sanitation, better food security and nutrition, and improved livelihoods. And while COVID-19 certainly increased protection risks, Outside of the pandemic, the system stepped up its implementation of protection activities for children and victims of sex and gender-based violence and sought to improve how it measures its results. Cash assistance, of course, continues to be an area that achieves measurable outcomes for people in crisis, for example, lower morbidity for children under the age of five, and therefore the extent to which the system expands the proportion of cash and voucher assistance it offers can be a reflection of its improved effectiveness this moved to nearly 20% of all IHA in 2020. We also saw positive developments in the timeliness of humanitarian response, driven by increased investments in preparedness and the rising experimentations with forecast-based financing and anticipatory action, driven by WFP, OCHA, IFRC, the START Network, and others. There was also emerging evidence from Bangladesh that providing aid before a crisis to households um, led to measurably improved outcomes. Still, there are questions as to whether this is enough for improving the system's overall speed of response, particularly when it comes to predictable crises such as drought, very relevant to the location we're in today. 
Our last report in 2018 noted that the response to the so-called four famines of 2016 and 17 was effective and successful, including, and that included, of, of course, Somalia. But the humanitarian practitioners we spoke to over the past few years questioned whether this had reflected systemic improvements to timeliness and early action, or if it had just been a one-off success. And I will leave it to our esteemed panel today to comment on how the current situation in Somalia might be answering that for us. And of course, when we look at the performance of the system, we have to look not only at what it achieves for crisis-affected people, but how it treats them. While we at ALNAP have always included surveys and interviews with aid recipients in our research for this project, for this edition, we went a step further and we worked with in-country researchers to ask aid recipients at the beginning of our research, what did they want to know about the performance of the humanitarian system? The top concern that we heard from them most frequently was whether aid is going to the right people. And when we looked at this, we found that a combination of access constraints and a lack of adequate communication meant that many affected people do not understand or agree with the reasons that agencies target some people for support and not others. Only 36% of aid recipients in our survey said that they felt aid was going to those who needed it most. The constraints to humanitarian space are having a particularly strong impact here, as we saw in our survey in Ethiopia, where the responses to questions such as, did you receive enough aid, or were you consulted on the aid you received, were considerably lower in Tigray than in other parts of the country, and they were in fact some of the lowest scores we've seen since our first survey in 2011. Concerns over aid diversion by armed groups, community elites, and others also came up repeatedly. Now, of course, these problems are certainly not new, and nor are they easy to address, but their significance for affected communities was one of the strongest messages we heard. The pandemic also had an impact on how the system engages with the people that it serves. While agencies talked of the adaptiveness that they showed during COVID-19, many of these adaptations were logistical in nature or small tweaks to programming, and few were, were in response to requests or feedback from crisis-affected people. For the increasing numbers of people who are caught up in long-term or repeated crises, this lack of adaptation is becoming a more severe issue, with higher numbers saying that the aid that they received was not addressing their priority needs over time. The pandemic also forced agencies to move to more remote forms of communication that were generally less preferred. And this may go some way to explaining why we found that the number of aid recipients who said they had the opportunity to feedback or complain remained unchanged since the 2018 report, despite the immense efforts made by many agencies to improve their feedback practices. And improving the participation of affected people clearly remains a priority for the future as this continues to be linked to better performance. We found yet again, as we saw in the 2018 report, that people who were consulted prior to receiving aid were 2.2 times more likely to say that that aid was relevant, 2.7 times more likely to say that it was of good quality, and 2.5 times more likely to say that they had received enough aid. And finally, there were two positive findings, one on dignity, with 73% of aid recipients saying that they felt treated with respect and dignity by aid workers. And the second one on PSEA, where the system made tangible improvements to how it handles and prevents the sexual exploitation and abuse of crisis-affected people, with more staff capacity and better coordination across agencies to prevent the hiring of perpetrators. But resources to support survivors are still ad hoc, and a majority of humanitarian practitioners still felt that organizations are only doing a fair or poor job on this. In short, the effectiveness of the system is well established, but it's limited to short-term outcomes in a specific set of areas, which is raising questions of relevance for people who are stuck in protracted and longer-term crises. The system has arguably improved its effectiveness by scaling cash and voucher assistance, but it's not scaling other effective ways of working, such as preparedness and anticipatory action. And while agencies have done more to engage with affected people, this has been more of a participation evolution than a revolution. And this last point ties to a wider theme running across our report, as we saw the system trying to implement the global commitments it made over the 2015 to 17 period. Overall here, we only saw mixed or partial progress, which could be considered positive, given the level of ambition of these commitments set against the sharp increase in caseload that the system has been facing over the past few years. 
but the slow pace of change has been disappointing for many, and for others, it has reflected the failings of an outdated model that continues to concentrate power amongst Western actors. One big area of concern here, of course, is funding. And here, over the past four years, there's been significant experimentation and incremental improvement as donors and partners sought to implement the grand bargain. Interestingly, when we go back to the first two state of the system reports in 2010 and 2012, there are a number of funding inefficiencies that were flagged by those reports that have been addressed partially by the grand bargain, such as harmonized reporting and donor assessments. But when it comes to providing funding that's more predictable and flexible, progress was less obvious as unearmarked funding proved volatile with no clear upward trend. And if UN and international partners were disappointed at the lack of progress in quality funding, there was perhaps even more cause for disappointment amongst their local and national partners who saw their share of direct humanitarian funding fall from 3.3% in 2018 to 1.2% of humanitarian assistance in 2021. Now, we all know that local and national actors receive much more of humanitarian funding indirectly through major international agencies, but even when we look at the data that's available there, the measurable amount is quite low, around 1.5% for local and national NGOs. That's NGO specific um, as opposed to all local and national actors. The lack of transparent reporting means that we're still unable to put an accurate global figure on the amount of this pass-through funding. Anti-racism movements and calls to decolonize aid challenged the international community to change its power dynamics. And while the COVID-19 pandemic offered opportunity to shift to a more locally-led model, there was no meaningful shift in power, with a majority of local and national NGOs in the, our, our surveys with Nir in Somalia and Turkey feeling that their partnerships still functioned mainly as subcontracting relationships defined by internationals. Six years on from the World Humanitarian Summit, we found that conversations and debates over how localized the system should become and how best to get there are still ongoing. So we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, let's conclude by looking back at what we've learned from the past four years. So to summarize, the humanitarian system has grown larger but it's not grown in proportion to the problem that it's trying to tackle, the size of which has risen due to both increased crises but also increased ambitions. The system is effective, but narrowly so, and the agency of people in crisis is increasingly being taken into account, but the system is still far from putting people fully in the center. The international humanitarian system is evolving, making observable improvements, but these are not as significant or as fast as desired, or as some might argue, required. And as the system debates its future identity, it is entering an era in which it is consistently under direct threat and cannot take multilateralism or global affirmation of humanitarian norms as a given. So looking to the challenging years ahead, all of this means that the humanitarian system will need to grapple with what solidarity with people in crisis really looks like in terms of its scale of ambition, in terms of its presence, in terms of what it offers, how it engages, and who leads it. And it will need to do this very important internal work while simultaneously defending the core humanitarian idea that all of us have a moral responsibility to stand with all people affected by crisis. Let us hope that it succeeds. Thank you.